I next want to introduce uh, Mr. Wojcikowski, sitting up in the front row for us here. Steve is a vintage dialysis patient and has been dialyzed for 19 years. And when his health permits, he's an active patient advocate. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address you all here today. As Dr. Jones said, I've been on dialysis a rather remarkable 19 years. If I don't have three four-hour dialysis treatments per week, I will die within two to four weeks. That's the routine of a kidney failure patient who's on dialysis. Today, from the patient's perspective, I'd like to tell you about some of the provisions of the Kidney Care Quality and Education Act, again, from the patient's perspective. 35 years ago, the science of dialysis, or really how to keep someone with kidney failure alive, was new, and the insurance companies didn't cover it. People were dying, so Congress stepped in. They modified Medicare so people with kidney failure could be covered, regardless of age. Eventually, insurance companies followed suit and in 1981, Congress required employee health care plans to begin to cover dialysis, although only for a limited period. We're at a crucial time with regard to kidney disease in this country. The high rates of diabetes, particularly adolescent diabetes, and high blood pressure, which are the two main causes of kidney failure, are ravaging our society. The kidney care bill would address that problem by increasing awareness and education for those at risk. New programs like that cost money. So the bill would also save Medicare money by extending the time private insurance pays for dialysis from 30 to 42 months. I believe that that extension is both fair and reasonable. Employers and their insurers have a vested interest in the health and the wellness of their employees. And this provision will only require them to make a relatively small financial contribution. I say small because very few patients remain on their employer-based insurance at 30 months. And only those who do would be affected by the proposed extension. From the time they start dialysis, if they are not on Medicare already, patients can drop that insurance and have Medicare pay for their health care. And experience has shown that many patients choose to switch to Medicare. Patients also die, many of them well before 30 months, and a few get transplants and a few smaller number miraculously recover their kidney function. The point is that very few patients out of the total patients on dialysis will be affected by this proposed extension. This is an opportunity for both the public and the private sectors to work together as partners to help Americans with kidney failure. Please I urge you, on behalf of all current and future, increasingly future dialysis patients, do the right thing. Thank you very much for your attention, but let me also thank all the healthcare professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the dialysis technicians, the administrators across our great nation who have dedicated themselves to keeping us dialysis patients alive. I would now like to invite Kathy LeBeau up. Uh, Kathy has been uh, on uh, dialysis since, since 2004. She's from New York. She most recently has been on home hemodialysis for the last three years. She's also on a kidney transplant waiting list. She's a patient advocate and a speaker for Renal Support Network, who is one of the members of KCP. As a person with kidney disease and a dialysis patient, I am most concerned about the potential changes to the Medicare ESRD program. 
Prior to being diagnosed, <clears throat> excuse me, I worked all my life and accessed health insurance through my employers, as do most working Americans when they are able. Following my being diagnosed, these providers have allowed me to access good quality health care with the half dozen specialists and health care professionals that I need to see on a regular basis to keep me healthy. Not to mention taking care of several hospitalizations and surgeries and the beginning of dialysis for me. My health care policies have also covered all my medi med many medications as I currently take about 20 pills a day in addition to the IV medications that I need <clears throat> with my dialysis treatments. It also allows me several wellness services, including health maintenance programs, case management, and coordination of services from my health care team. And all are at minimal cost out of pocket to me. As any kidney patient will tell you, this is a benefit that makes the difference in enjoying relatively good health, all things considered, and a satisfactory quality of life. And while I am very grateful to the safety net that Medicare provides to the many individuals with kidney disease, and to me as a secondary payer, I cannot help but wonder why Medicare allows this to be the only chronic condition for which private insurers can limit their coverage. The extension of the Medicare secondary payer provision will allow me the choice to continue or change my benefits for a longer period of time than I can currently, and I appreciate that. I also understand that it can provide a funding mechanism for Medicare programs that could benefit me and fellow patients such as standardized technician training, public and patient education programs, and quality care incentives. In the fiscal environment that we inhabit, this is fair and equitable. In the interest of maintaining the health and well-being of kidney patients across the country so they can continue to be contrib contributing members of society, I urge the members of Congress to support the original tenets of the Kidney Care Quality and Education Act, including the MSP extension and the funding of these positive provisions for the Medicare and stage renal disease program. Thank you very much. I would like to in invite up at this point Sue Bailey of Bluemont, Virginia. Sue's husband, Bill, has uh, diabetes for over 30 years. He's endured numerous laser and eye surgeries, a leg amputation, and his kidneys have failed. Bill and Sue both work to ensure that they don't have to accept disability. Bill is a pastor at Leesburg's church, and Sue recently worked at the Loudoun Public School System in Virginia. Their previous health care costs them $1,300 per month. But now, with Sue's job, it costs $150 per month. My husband, Bill, is 59, and he's had diabetes for over 30 years. As a result of this, he's had numerous laser surgeries, eye surgery, and had his leg amputated, and his kidneys have now failed. He still works as pastor of Leesburg Apostolic Church, Leesburg, Virginia, with the help of several good men. He doesn't want to be on disability and Medicare. We have tried to keep health insurance, the last one being Kaiser Permanente, until the premium became $1,300 a month, and that became out of our reach. Seeing our dilemma, we knew I would have to go to work. While others would ask about the pay scale, I would ask, how good is your insurance? When we received our benefits package, others would look at the benefits, and I would go directly to the back of the book and see what it didn't cover. I went to work for Loudoun County Public Schools because they have the best insurance with only $150 monthly premiums. I didn't know my husband would be forced to go on Medicare. That is why I work so he doesn't have to. If he does go on Medicare, we will be forced to pay two premiums. Does this mean that two office visits? And if Medicare becomes my primary insurance, Cigna becomes my secondary insurance. Well, and they will only pay so much. Cigna can decide if they choose not to pay what is left and that will make us paying more out-of-pocket expense. Being a caregiver for both parents, I know firsthand about the tape, red tape and the paperwork. They send a statement stating what they will pay and what they will not. There is no way you can match this up to office visits or what procedures you have had. I have tried. After my father died, I opened his desk drawer to find over 75 unopened statements because he was too sick and frustrated to deal with it. If my husband does go on Medicare, where does this leave me? On my own policy? Not to mention the endless paperwork. As of now, my husband does dialysis Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. The other off days, he sees his numerous doctors that I take him to. I simply cannot bury this, carry this burden of the paperwork and all the endless trips. Please look at this and help us.